Hello everyone and welcome back to Breaking Bread. This is the Birmingham Food Podcast. Gives you a little behind the scenes look at all the food in Birmingham. Cool little interviews with Michelin star chefs and food producers, uh, interior designers, all that kind of jazz. I'm your host Liam and this is Carl. What? No foreign language. It's short of foreign languages today. You know, I know about like four hellos. I'll be using more now. <laughs> I feel like you should look one up for every episode. Let him one every week. I was week. thinking about looking one up and I was like, should I just look up some of those? And I thought, no, I should just use the ones I know. Yeah. Yeah. How's things? Yeah, sound, sound. Well, it's all fucking lockdowns kicked in again. Yeah, we're here in lockdown, uh, recording this socially distance on our walk in the park. But all they've done is, like, schools are still open. Building sites are still open. Factories are still open. Most, like, half the shops are still open. All they've done is shut shit that I want to go to. <laughs> so you feel like, maybe it's a Truman show. They're just trying to test cars, yeah. see how far they I can push I needed a haircut it. and I didn't <laughs> get one. So now I look like a twat. And come Christmas, I'm going to look even stupider. Or I've got to shave it again. So that's not great. All my favourite restaurants and bars are all closed. But luckily, most of them doing takeout and delivery stuff, which will go on to in the next episode you don't think anything's going to open before christmas i don't see how they're going to get the r number down with schools still going to school i think it's that's where most transmissions are coming from is school you only have to drive for like i'm not knocking it you kids need to be going to school they need to find a way of doing it but doing it safely yeah and unfortunately for us it means our restaurants are closed which is heartbreaking again well yeah and it's knocked a couple of interviews that we had planned on the head as well which is a really shame because a couple of them I was really excited about. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even today's interview, like not knocking Brendan, we really wanted Brendan to ha- come on at some stage, but it was meant to be with somebody else that ha- we had to kind of just. It, well, it just it's been hard to work things out, hasn't it? Like it's just. Yes, yeah, so we've had some more so rely on people we know well. Yeah, so obviously Brendan's a mate. So and it, we've been talking about doing it for a long time. It was just getting him in, and then he happened to be free. I happened to be free. Unfortunately, you weren't, but. Th- that's just how it... No. Well, I wasn't free. <laughs> I was supposed to be looking after our daughter that morning. But then my missus, who was supposed to be going for a walk that had been planned for weeks that morning, they all decided they were going to do it in the afternoon instead. Yeah. And they didn't tell me till like, you were already at the interview. And I was like, you've got to mm. be fucking joking me. Nah, it's just one of them, isn't it? COVID times. We're having to just do the best we can. I think Brendan's done a good job. We're not going to get... <laughs> Any more interviews in, I don't think. We've got another episode, which we're going to release for you. Keep an eye out for that. We're going to release it in early December. And that will be our kind of season finale and end of year review kind of thing. Just me and Carl. So keep keep an eye out for that. Where did you get to eat before the lockdown came in? Oh, luckily I'd booked in a couple of things over the last sort of week, week and a half. I had the... Um, Japanese pop up at Little Blackwood by what's the name again? Kadawari. Kadawari. Yeah, I can never remember how to say yeah, it. Me ne- that's probably wrong. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but oh, mate, it was great. I had the uh, spicy miso ramen. And it, outside of Japan, that's probably one of the best ramens I've ever had. That's high price because we've had quite a few lately. Yeah, with the, if I see somewhere doing some, or I can order one or make one, I usually do. And yeah, it was really good. And he did fried chicken with it. Which is exactly like the fried chicken you get in Japan. It was fantastic. Oh, I'd love I'm gutted, yeah, because me and you were supposed to go. And then Boris brought in the rules <laughs> yeah. that said you couldn't go out with another household for dinner or anything. So that was us knackered. So you had to go with yeah, us. Yeah, literally a couple of days. We had to think about <laughs> who was going to go, didn't we? Yeah, you... you we just tossed a coin and I won, so I yeah, went with you the missus. Go, which I'm very jealous. Not bitter at all about. <laughs> no. Well, I'll give you the opportunity to take yeah, it since did, I'd already tried did. it. Uh, to be honest, I was tempted to book a table to go on my own. To be, to be honest, it, I was thinking that I'll book it for the next day. It was that good. <laughs> really was. And they're doing deliveries over lockdown as well, aren't they? Yes, yeah, so you'll be able to it. order some off them. I'll definitely be ordering a few. And they're looking for their own place, so sometime next year. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully they might have an actual place where you can go and enjoy amazing ramen. Their story is brilliant. It'd be good to get them on at some point, actually, because I know we just started during the lockdown. The yeah, last... well, I mentioned it to him. He was up for it. And yeah. then I managed on the last night, 
before lockdown, I managed to get into a table at Raja Monkey on the Stratford Road. I mean, I've been using it for years anyway, but I haven't been since they've refurbed it. So they've knocked through to the place next door, and it's much bigger now. Mm. And I tell you what, if we hadn't booked, we wouldn't have got a table. That's good. Yeah, it's always looking busy. And considering that the Stratford Road had roadworks the entire way up it, and you couldn't drive up the Stratford Road at all, mm. it was still heaving. What did you have? Oh, mate, what didn't I have? I've ordered way too much. I had <laughs> chicken thigh starter. It had been like marinated in like almonds and stuff like this. Almond milk with like spices and stuff. It was fantastic. And my main had this spicy chili lamb that was like a smoked lamb curry. Ooh, but really yum. hot. Oh, it was phenomenal. Big, giant, like pieces of lamb like your fist. That's what you want, that is. Yeah, it was unreal. It was a perfect meal, to be honest. What, who had the bone marrow sauce or some bone marrow sauce? That was the missus. She had um, the beef biryani mm. and it, like, giant pieces of beef in this like clay pot with all the biryani in there. And then it came with like a bone marrow sauce with the bone marrow on top of it as well. Mm. That was great. It looks superb. I was surprised by the photos. I don't know why. Cause I've li- I think I had delivery once or something for take it very early on. But I always had it in my head that it was like a more of a street foody kind of place. But what you described to me and what I've seen on the photos, it looked more like what I, f- I would expect to get in Lausanne. You could go there and get just street food if you wanted. Like my Mrs. Starter. It's not technically a starter, but she had like the kima, turkey kima, and it came with like a pav bun, so really buttery. and Oh, yeah. That was fantastic. It was really nice. And we had sides. I had crushed potatoes. The Mrs. had cauliflower. We had rice and arm breads. Oh, nice. so you can eat there as sort of like a street food place if you wish, or you can go there and just eat there like a curry house. Mm. But like, sounds a bit more like an upmarket kind of curry house. Oh yeah, it's really yeah. good. Yeah, I was really happy that was the last meal out for a while. Oh, that's good. I've uh, I didn't really get a chance to get out because I had a couple of things on this week. It's been a bit of a mad week. Obviously, moving house has been a nightmare. But. I managed to get last Saturday, I went on a little tear, I went to town obviously to record this interview with Brendan, came out starving, standard, so I decided to go for the first place I've seen, which was Cherry Reds, uh, nice. I've, I've not actually been to Cherry Reds for breakfast. I can't believe you've not been, I, I love Cherry Reds, the food's great there, yeah, well just, the whole place, I'll put it out there now, Cherry Reds my wife's favourite place in town, and I love it too. I can, if I go in there, I'm happy to stay there for as long as they'll have me. I can see why, in fairness. It was really nice in there. The, the people were in, like, it was really safe. One of the safest places I've been to during COVID. Like, they, they made you scan in and everything. And I've seen them actually turn people away who didn't refuse to scan in. I mean, like, what's wrong with people? Who's going to refuse to Somebody scan? Somebody did, yeah. A couple of refused to wear masks and they turned them away. And I'm thinking... So they should get the fuck out. I know, it's, it's hard, hard to put a fucking mask on. Is it? This is really pissing me off, people with masks. It's true, but it's heartbreaking because I know, like, they really need that money. Yeah. <laughs> and they're having to turn people away and it's just because they're too selfish to put a mask on for a few seconds. I know. You've yeah. only got to wear it to the table. And then yeah. if you go for a piss, that's it. But the food... Someone said to me before about their pancakes being good. I can't, it might have been Siobhan, actually. And I yeah, thought I I'm think going she's had them, yeah. I think she's had them. And had a, ha- a little pancake menu, so they didn't have just like the obligatory pancakes, bacon, maple syrup. There was a little menu, and obviously I went for the big breakfast <laughs> with the bacon. Nice. Bacon, two bacon, two sausage, scrambled eggs, three of the biggest pancakes I think I've had, and hash brown and maple syrup. Oh. Mm. Well, yeah. the same... I oh, wouldn't like that. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I was waiting for you to go, yeah. and then I got the maple syrup and put it all over the eggs, the bacon, it's the hash brown. <laughs> like, if you just had, without the pancakes, and you just had that dinner, like, you wouldn't go into a cafe and be like, oh, can I have some maple syrup and then dip your sausage in fucking maple syrup, would you? I felt like elf. <laughs> oh, fucking mental. I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I don't it. get it. It was superb, and I had two lattes to wash it down. Great coffee as well. Yeah, really impressive place. I love that. Yeah, the great food. Nice. The lunches are really good there and the dinners. Like, I usually, they do a wicked, like, fr- um, not fried chicken burger, just like a grilled chicken burger. Mm. It's fantastic. And then from there, I nipped over to Bake because Bake happened to be called off at the farmer's market in Mosley, but we were able to go into Tilt, which was handy for me. So I just marched into Tilt. There was you know, no I've never queue. been to Tilt. Never been to Tilt? I haven't had the chance, oh no. I've wanted to go for ages. I like pinball machines as well. That's the weird thing. I even like pinball machines. Mate, it's brilliant. No, I love it. I do. I've yeah, they've got so many times. good things. And they have they have a lot of baked stuff on anyway, don't they? They have the bunt cakes there. Yeah, yeah. 
lucky to have anyone. Yeah, it was nice. I had plenty of uh, PBJ, so I was able to get a couple. That's the Birmingham spirit, isn't it? Like, he mm. couldn't sell his stuff at the farmer's market because it was too windy for his tent. So Tilt were like, yeah, sell it here. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. We got plenty of room to come in here. Brilliant. That's what you want, isn't it? And then I got home, and just as I got home, uh, Andy Lowe and Slow got delivered. Oh, man. <laughs> so jealous of this. <laughs> yes, that was awesome as well. What did you have? The beef rib. Rib of beef or beef rib, short rib, you know, the big chunk of smoke. Yeah, that proper beef oh, rib. Oh, God. It was so good. Yeah. So, so good. I mean, I, I know it's cliche. I could have cut it with a spoon. Easy to heat up and everything like that. There's good instructions on oh, that. Yeah, but it's, it's the way he tells you to do it as well. It's so juicy. Like, uh, you just, um, <laughs> it sounds a bit crap, doesn't it? Boil in the bag. You yeah. just literally boil some water on the pan. Look for the timings and then stick them in at the right time so that they all cook together. You know what I mean? Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. I think it was only like 20 minutes. It's the only way you could warm that up. You couldn't warm it up any other way. If you put it in the oven, it's going to dry out. Yeah, it'll just dry out. But no, I mean, if you sit on it, even Andy said like how moist it still looked. It was as juicy. It was brilliant. Mm, really good. So that was nice. And then came with mac and cheese. Mac and cheese was brilliant. Oh, yeah. I added a bit more cheese on top and then... Smashed up a bag of uh, Red Leicester mini cheddars. You had the Red Leicester mini cheddars? I don't think I've had the Red Leicester ones. Oh, I like normal super. ones, though. These are a bit more, like, zingy-like. So I smashed all them up, put them on top, melted it in the oven. That was nice as well. And then he gave me some pig cheeks on the side. Oh, man. Just as a taster. Oh, God. They were so... If it, next... I think anything I order will always come with pig cheeks from now on, because... They are just... Anyone tells me there's a better cut of meat on an animal than the cheek, they're a fucking liar. It was superb. I was looking forward to the beef all week, but the pig cheeks might might have start stealed the show a little bit. Yeah, I bet. They were stunning. Really stunning. Yeah, anything cheek. The lamb. I don't think lamb. Do lambs have cheeks? I don't think so. If they did, I'd eat them. I'd imagine <laughs> they're I'm, cheek. Looking, I'm trying to picture <laughs> their face now. It doesn't look like there'd be a lot of cheek there. No, not a lot of cheek there. Although you can eat lamb head, so there must be some meat on it. Yeah, yeah. Overall, definitely having pig cheeks from now on from Andy. I mean, I'm definitely getting one of his roast dinners over lockdown. That's yeah, they that. look great. I think I'm going to order something soon and get probably the pig cheeks will be all right up there. I can't recommend it enough. I mean, 25 quid for all that food, and it it's that's cheaper than what we'd spend at a Chinese takeaway or an Indian takeaway. Yeah, if I get an Indian takeaway, you're looking at 30, 40 quid. Yeah, nearly everything's 40 to 50 quid now, isn't it? Like, it's ridiculous, yeah. It's well, Miss always laughed, as I was saying. What do you get for 50 quid nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> it's true though. You can't even go to the chip shop. We'll like we'll change from yeah. a twenty. Chip is not cheap. <laughs> not cheap as chips anymore. Or maybe we just <laughs> eat a lot. <laughs> I just left away a joke. <laughs> maybe we just eat way too much. Yeah, that's a fact. Did it come with any sides or salsas or anything like that? It came with the, the highest sauce I've ever had in my oh, life. Oh bet Maria loved that. <laughs> I told her. She was like, Well I just try it. I was like, Don't try. As much as I would find it hilarious to watch you rolling <laughs> on the floor and looking for water, you just don't try it because it was. But you know what? It was so addictive. <laughs> it was so addictive. Yeah, that's the thing I about kept chilling. pouring it on on my pig cheek, and I was like, "This is hotter than anything." Like, it's probably too hot for me, and I was like hiccuping <laughs> and sweating. <laughs> but it was so it the zing. It was so nice. It was yeah, so I'd addictive. Love that, like, I love yeah, that stuff. It was just called it a barbecue gravy, but it was, yeah, it was really, really good. And obviously then with the mac and cheese as well. And I just threw a few chips on, but I smothered the chips in um, tikka seasoning, like, just to nice. make it a bit different, you know. Yeah, the man's a legend, man. You didn't need the chips, to be honest. I'm just greedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in your head, <laughs> you're thinking, yeah, I'll fuck, fuck some chips on this as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm make it do. perfect, some chips. But yeah, I always think that, I always say anything I make, and I think, yeah, I'll put a couple of chips on as mm. well. I had intended to make some like proper homemade wedges and stuff, but then Halloween Saturday was that busy. Like I was like, oh no, I don't have time to make wedges now. So no. put the put the little one to bed, and that was it. Then get the Andy Low and Slow going. It was brilliant. That's it. I had a takeaway night. last week, and it came for thirty five quid. You yeah. had that for twenty five quid. Bargain. Real so bargain. A lot of these, are a lot cheaper than takeaway. Like I got Rudy's. I ordered four pizzas from Rudy's. I had um, one last week. The pizzas cost nothing. Mm. You can order a four, put them in the freezer. And you've got them whenever you want them. Then just take them out in the morning. And it's literally it's better than any takeaway pizza I've ever had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's good stuff to look out for for lockdown. That's uh, pretty much all we've eaten. Mazza, we better get on to today's episode before oh, yeah, we yeah, go yeah. on for about two hours. <laughs> 
Yeah, so today, as we've already touched on, we are with Brendan. So as I was saying in the podcast, you know, Brendan is the gaffer of Bacchus, a really like unusual bar uptown. It's it's unique. Yeah, I was going to say, say like, that's the only sort of, because I couldn't go. I was a little oh, chain player. And then it, that sort of went out of my head when I remembered it was Bacchus. Because mm. that is, it's in my head, it's not a bad chain player. It's a good chain player. It's like mm. we've done rec- podcasts there with people and... I used to go there when I was younger because it was an interesting place. It's underground. Yeah. It's got <laughs> like, coats of armour and big suits of armour and loads of stuff all over the place. It's an interesting place to go. It's the kind of place where you used to go in on a Saturday, like, daytime drinking. And you'd come out and be really surprised that it was light. I know, yeah. <laughs> you'd be like, oh, oh it's still fucking light. <laughs> it's daylight, what's going on? Yeah, don't know when you're stumbling around. You're like, I'm not pissed. <laughs> and, uh, obviously, uh, Brendan's let us record a few episodes from Bacchus, so nice to kind of give something back and he's always been mad keen to come on the show and as we said before like we, we were kind of let down last minute and brendan like a hero jumped in he used to be my gaffer at a few pubs and more than that he's, he's my mate basically like we've been friends for a long time and i mean i said in the last episode with andy lone slow i had that story about a gaffer that was really understanding to some problems i was going through that was brendan uh, just a really great dude and he's really knowledgeable about I mean he loves his job loves hospitality loves being a manager his man management skills I think are second to none I know I'm biased but the reason we're friends is because I respect how good of a manager he was now I'm cringing because I know he's listening to this like with a massive head because <laughs> <laughs> he, he loves it I know he loves it but yeah it's true um so yeah, really great episode. We're going to TripAdvisor. I really, if you listen to no other part of this episode, just go and listen to TripAdvisor stuff because I guarantee you'll get something from it. You will. If you own a business or you have any kind of business that's getting reviewed on TripAdvisor, you're probably pissed off with TripAdvisor like everyone else is. But there's ways of using it to your advantage and Brendan does that better than anyone. Go and have a look at the Bacchus TripAdvisor page. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. His, re- his responses to those people all of that it's class so yeah just a great episode really enjoyed doing it nice to sit down with a friend and have a good old chat hope you all enjoy it ladies and gentlemen brendan hi yeah so today i'm joined by brendan hi brendan is the gaffer at backus bar on new it's new street out there isn't it new street. yeah it's new street yeah it's funny, un- isn't underneath it? the burlington hotel like from me, lived here your life, and you still really don't know the names of all the little. <laughs> yeah, no one knows the names of all the streets. And then, Brendan used to be my gaffer, so he's one of the only people who listens to this podcast and thinks that fucking brick. He's talking like he knows hospitality, but <laughs> he never displayed it when he worked. For he's me. lying <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> but, but more important than all of that, Brendan's my mate. I am, yeah, 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 yeah definitely. We've known each other a long time. Yeah, we have. Yeah, very Two. long. 2006. Was that when it was 2006? 2006. I I told you this when we went for dinner a few weeks ago. I went for an interview at it was called Bar Senza. Bar Senza in Solio. Delightful place, anyone who knows that place. <laughs> but I went for my interview in the afternoon with the manager, who was Chris. And he, he kind of just sat me down and said, can you serve a pint? Have you worked in the pub before? Can you start tonight? <laughs> <laughs> You've got two arms, two legs and a head. <laughs> that was basically Get behind that bar. And it, I think I lied and said I had worked at a pub. <laughs> <laughs> so I just took, because my, my cousin was working there at the time, so he just said, J- this is what he'll say, and he's just desperate. To, I've told him that you're really good at this, so he's just going to employ you, basically. Yeah. So I was like, cool. So I started that night, and Chris wasn't there, but you were. Yeah, I was there. And you came and done like a little pre-talk before it got busy. <laughs> a pre-shift briefing. And you were like, yeah, <laughs> listen, everybody, it's going to be really fucking busy tonight. It's pay weekend. We're going to get absolutely battered. It's going to be great fun. I want you all to have a good time. We've got two new starters tonight, but I don't want that to be an excuse. They're going to be brilliant. You're all going to be brilliant. Let's get on with it. Like, <laughs> there we go. G, yeah, this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be all right. I've got this. <laughs> Brendan believes in me. He doesn't even know me. <laughs> yeah, that was our first time. And then we've kind of just kept in contact over the years. Always kept in contact, yeah. And then you, uh, you worked for me. At, well, not for me. I wasn't the general manager, I was the assistant manager at the, the White Swan in yeah. Solihull. It's funny because I remember the day you left Barsenza and I was like, 
Yeah, <laughs> sold my sold my soul to the devil, man. Then, a couple of years later, I'll join you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. didn't take you long. <laughs> yeah, that was an experience. The yeah, that was. Uh, I, I I kind of categorise that as the worst experience of my life, but also the funniest experience of my life working at Weatherspoons. I was gonna say Weatherspoons in general, or just the White Swan. Oh mate, well, we, we, the White Swan was good. I, I you know I didn't mind the White Swan. It was when uh, when I took over the Elizabeth of York in Mosley, that's when everything went wrong in life. Yeah, so just when I thought <laughs> I, I couldn't contradict myself anymore, we left that kind of fairly cushy pub in Sully and we both went to the Elizabeth, the Elizabeth York of York in Mosley. <laughs> in Mosley. Which on a Friday and Saturday night, it's not too dissimilar to most pubs. Yeah. But it's on a Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> oh, mate, it's so weird. <laughs> in February. <laughs> <Isn't it? laughs> People, people coming in with no shoes on and <laughs> just, it, 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 that was horrific. Oh, I hated that pub so much. I think you reminded me the last, that when we went for dinner a few weeks ago, about somebody walking in and shitting in the middle of the pub. Yeah, yeah. Someone walked in and shit in the, in the middle of the pub. I remember uh, we had loads of things happen. People um, having a shit in the urinals. Someone, <laughs> someone once went in and emptied a bag of cement in the, uh, in the toilets. So we had to close <laughs> the pub because all of the toilets were full of cement. <laughs> I think that's a review. Like, that's a review. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm gonna give, I was going to give you a one star, but instead. <laughs> I was going to give you one star and trip by them instead of shit on the table just to let you know what I thought about Oh, my God. <laughs> Absolutely appalling. The, the things that happened in that pub, it was just... It was a daily treat, let's say. It was an experience. It's a, it's it's that that pub, the Elizabeth of York in Mosley, is what everybody has a picture in their mind of a Weatherspoons to be. Yeah. You know, um, old men desperately to get into the pub at eight o'clock in the morning, um, with their one pound sixty in hand, ready to have a pint of ale, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then by nine o'clock you just absolutely rammed every table taken up of loads of old men that are staying in there until four o'clock in the afternoon drinking. <laughs> and, and then the abuse that ensues when they're hammered at two o'clock. <laughs> yeah, it's a crap. I mean, I mentioned on the Chris episode before how it always amazed me how when prices were lower, everyone's expectations went higher. Yeah. And people just treated you worse. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, you're giving me something for nearly free. <laughs> Fuck you. Absolutely. <laughs> the amount of complaints you used to get on, um, on State Club on a Tuesday evening, You'd be giving someone an eight-ounce sirloin steak, which, to be honest, the steak wasn't that bad because obviously we'd have, you know, got it out, rested the meat and everything like that, you know, treated it well. So you'd have an eight-ounce sirloin steak with chips, peas, tomato mushrooms, and a pint for four pound ninety-nine. You can't even get a pint for four ninety-nine in some places. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you'd, have, you'd have all of that. And then literally they'd be going, why is there only 14 chips on this plate? <laughs> I don't know, mate. <laughs> How's your steak cooked? Yeah, steak's cooked perfect, but I need more chips. <laughs> Cheers. The steak was perfect until Liam got in the kitchen and started <laughs> microwaving the fuckers. <laughs> Should have been the deep fat fryer. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not trying to get a job with one spoon to get mate. <laughs> okay, listen to this. Note, we did not do that. <laughs> Jimmy did. <laughs> oh God, Jimmy. We had a guy called Jimmy that worked for us who had a really big beard. And it's so big that the beard net wouldn't fit <laughs> like <laughs> over his beard. And he just didn't give a fuck, did he? He was an actor and he, he chose, chose Weatherspoons as his second job. Apart from the fact that he had no acting going on. <laughs> so <laughs> it was his only job. <laughs> And he'd just turn up when he wanted, leave when he wanted, <laughs> he'd, he'd cook what he wanted. <laughs> I remember going upstairs once and he was eating a full cod um, in a bun. <laughs> just, he was hanging out both sides. I'm like, what are you doing? And he was like, I, well, I was like, you, you, you paid for a chicken burger? <laughs> yeah, I decided I wanted a fish burger. <laughs> Fantastic. Some good times, man. Before I got to meet you in 2006... How long had you been working in bars? How did you get to management? Oh, um, well, so my full career really is I, um, when I was 16, I started glass collecting in a nightclub in Burton upon Trent, which is where I'm from. The nightclub was, uh, it was called Sloppy Joe's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. It was part of the, uh, the Midland Hotel um, in Burton. It was, it was a very, very uh, busy nightclub. Um, Fridays and Saturdays, always absolutely rammed, absolutely rammed. 
And uh, this was obviously in the days when people didn't give a fuck about under 18s because we would finish work at like half two in the morning. It closed at two. So we'd finish work at half two. There was a team of four glass collectors, um, probably eight bar staff. That's how busy. It was only a small place, but it was very busy. Um, and yeah, we'd, uh, we'd finish work at about half two. The managers had let us drink as much as we wanted and, until four. So it was like power drinking until 4 a.m. And then they'd be like, right, see you later. And literally, they'd just, they'd just push you out the door. There was me as a pissed up. 16 year old lad just in the middle of Burton on Trent no money for a taxi home right I've just got to walk see you later and I just walk home but I, lo- I absolutely loved it so I, I then started working there Thursdays Fridays and Saturdays um, I'd very rarely miss a shift because it was like all of my friends had show, like you know this was in the days when you drink when you were 16 anyway so all of my friends used to come in there and, and socialize so you know obviously as a young 16 year old you'd you know steal the odd pint and or bottle up here and there and um when i'm saying bottle i mean like bottle of vodka <laughs> and drink that during your shift uh, and get steaming and then Sometimes I'd be able to finish at midnight, like if it wasn't if it wasn't that busy. So then I could join my friends, or if I did stay, you know, and and, and stay until two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I'd go to an after party and meet my friends there mm. as well. So I, I, all of a sudden, for me as a very sociable guy, I was like, "Fucking hell, man! I'm getting paid to socialise with people." And although I was only on two pound an hour as a glass collector, you know, don't forget I was only 16 and this was in 1996. So, um, yeah, it was, that was fantastic. So I loved it. But then um, as my day job, because I'd left school, I was working in an office um, for a builder's merchant. um, And I absolutely hated it. Soul destroying. Oh, mate, going in to the same place at the same time, seeing the same people doing the same things every single day of your life, having the lunch time at the same time and eating the same thing for lunch. And, you know, it was just mundane. And, uh, you know, and obviously as a 16, 17 year old lad, all I was doing was inputting um, invoices onto the onto the computer and um putting time sheets on and things like this it was just boring all oh, right okay the plumber's obviously been to a house today and he's installed piping and put a new tap in that's pretty much what he did yesterday i'm glad i'm typing exactly the same thing again and then yeah i remember when i was when i was 18 it was probably a week after my 18th birthday i was pissed up um i'd obviously finished glass collecting i wasn't doing that anymore and um i was in a bar in burton on trent um, called Edwards, if anybody remembers the uh, the, tr- the chain that was Edwards, uh, owned by Mitchells and Butlers, uh, or Bass at the time. Um, and I was in there and um, I ordered two pints of Carlin off the manager. The manager gave me the two pints of Carlin and then said, don't suppose you've got any bar work available. And he said, um, he said, yeah, I have actually. If you, if you want to come in tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for your interview, then if you make it in for your interview, I'll more than likely give you the job. Um, and obviously knowing that, you know, I'm out on the piss. So I went, yeah, okay, then. I put my hand out to shake his hand, and I knocked these two pints of Carlin, and they, they, they fell off the bar. One of them fell into the ice well behind the bar, shattering in there. The Carlin went all over the manager, and then I was like, oh, well, that's me, footling, isn't it? <laughs> I won't bother. I won't waste your time tomorrow. And he said, no, no, hold on. So he gave me another two pints, and he said, listen, everyone deserves a second chance. Just... Just so happens that you're already on yours. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so he... Um, was that Chris? No, it wasn't no. Chris. It was a guy called Simon. Chris wasn't working there at that, at that time. He started probably two months later um, as the assistant manager there. I was, um, gonna, I was just thinking, I see where Chris got his interview start. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> it. Well, that, that's what everyone was like. In them days, you know, it's so hard to get bar staff and especially good or reliable staff it was uh, it was unbelievable. So yeah, well anyway, I went out and got absolutely tanked up. Um, got back home at three, four o'clock in the morning as normal, and then um, left a note, a very drunken note for my mum saying you've got to wake me up um, at nine o'clock and you need to give me a lift into town. I've got an interview for a job at ten. So yeah, I turned up there at ten o'clock in the morning, absolutely rough as anything, and uh, and the manager literally came out, started laughing at me, and was like, I can't believe you turned up. Fair play. Yeah, you, when can you start? Um, 
so I started the following week, handed my notice in, obviously, with uh, with my office job, and then uh, and then started working in in that bar. Then um, I absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was just a laugh a minute. It was hard work. It was proper graft um, because obviously we were so busy at weekends. Um, every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, from seven o'clock onwards, we were probably at capacity. It was absolutely rammed. It was a great laugh. I worked with some of the best people that I've ever worked with. Still keep in touch with five or six of them now, um, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, it, every every single thing about it, I loved. Um, I, I, got, I got to pull birds. I got to get pissed whilst I was working. Uh, maybe the manager didn't know that I was doing that. Um, but yeah, we'd uh, we'd always go and go missing for half an hour here and there, where I'd just be with my mates and having a beer. Um, loads of things like that. But generally, I loved it that much that I was always the top taking barman. So every Friday, Saturday night, I'd uh, there'd be me and another guy called Gav that we'd always have a little competition between ourselves to see who could get, you know, take the most money behind the bar. And I was always averaging out about. 13, 1400 quid on a Saturday. I know, yeah, which you've got to think, this was, you know, this is in the days, it was £1.90 for a pint of Carlin. <laughs> like, yeah, two, £2.10 for a Bacardi Breezer. <laughs> and we had all the flavours. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, so we had a guy um, started working there as, a, as an assistant manager, Chris. Yeah. Uh, Chris Hall, uh, my mentor, my life mentor. <laughs> He, um, he started working there as an assistant manager. Um, me and him got on like a house on fire and uh, started going out together. Um, we, I'd always have either a, either a Thursday night or a Friday night off. So one week could be a Thursday, the next week could be a Friday, obviously, alternating that way. I could never have Saturday nights off unless I, bu- unless I booked them. But that was fine. So we'd always go out. Like Chris would rotor it, so he would be off on that same night that I'd be off as well. Yeah. And then, um, and then yeah, we'd go out. Um, go out drinking in, in Burton. Really funny. Some sometimes we just had that. Yeah, honestly, it, we, you go into places on a Thursday night, and everywhere was a pound of drink. So student nights. Yeah, there. yeah. Uh, well, you say student nights. Bloody no, no university <laughs> in Burton and Trent, is there? So they're obviously aiming for under 18s if they're saying student night. But yeah, it was it was a pound in and a pound of drink, and we just used to get into some proper messes. Um, which was great. But then, yeah, eventually Chris, um, he moved to Birmingham and, uh, and he started, uh, he became the general manager of, um, of Edwards on Broad Street, which is now Reflex. Yeah. Um, and that was his first general manager job. And then uh, randomly, I came over to Birmingham to see him, um, obviously because I missed him and I was pining <laughs> for my mate. Um, and it, I mean, the guy's like nine years older than me. You know, it was a, it was an unha- unhealthy relationship. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we uh, I, I went I went out uh, drinking with him in Birmingham, and uh, and basically he said, "Listen, I want you to come over to Birmingham and be my team leader at the pub, and I'll uh, and I'll get you ready to be an assistant manager, and then you can become the assistant manager here, and then um, you know, obviously I'll, I'll then get you ready to be a general manager. So, what are your thoughts on that?" And I was like, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll do that. So at the age of 19, I said goodbye to mummy and daddy mm. and uh, left my house and moved in above the pub, which wasn't allowed. <laughs> it definitely was not fit for accommodation. <laughs> but yeah, just uh, started crashing there every night of the week. And, uh, and we had all the trials and tribulations of working on Broad Street for, uh, for quite some time, which was obviously amazing fun. Something I never experienced when I was doing the old pub thing, which I don't really feel like I've missed out, to be honest. I oh, know. Well, <laughs> I'd say you did miss out. Like, I I loved it. I, it, it. I was made for it. Absolutely made for it. So this was obviously 1999 that I've moved to Birmingham um, on my own. Um, my uh, girlfriend at the time, um, she went to Plymouth University. So she was well out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> couldn't be any further away. <laughs> it was um, yeah, she couldn't have any eyes on me there. <laughs> so that was uh, yeah, so that was great fun. We had some trials and tribulations there. Bar work, notoriously underpaid, long hours. <laughs> yeah. 
was, did any of that bother you, or was it just that? Well, no, backlog? not really. I mean, I was when I started with Edwards, I was on three pounds sixty-three an hour, mm-hmm. um, which obviously <laughs> you couldn't get away with paying anyone that now. Um, and yeah, you know, you'd, you the way your shifts were, you'd you'd have to do a close on a on a Saturday night, for instance. And you wouldn't you wouldn't finish work until maybe two half two in the morning. We closed at one, so you'd finish two half two in the morning. Then obviously you'd have a couple of beers, and then yeah, the pub would open again at um, ten in the morning. So you'd have to be in for nine in the morning. Sometimes you know I wouldn't be leaving the pub until I don't know what time really, like four, and then yeah, yeah and then back in for nine to to start the open. Um, feeling rough as anything and tired. It was tiring. I think the worst the worst time without a shadow of a doubt was when I became an assistant manager. So when I became an assistant manager at Edwards on Broad Street, I was on 11 and a half grand a year on salary. And uh, and I'd say that we were regularly doing 70 hours a week. Um, it was just the way it was. Like that was that was it. You know, you'd, you'd have the excuse of, well, it's always been like this. And... Yeah. I I didn't really mind to be honest. That we, you you could only you couldn't have anybody um, below an assistant manager opening or closing the business because mm. of obviously responsibility wise yeah. being a key holder all of that. So um, this was you know in ninety nine. So yeah, when I became an assistant manager there, then I um, I had to literally do. So Chris would have a Sunday and a Monday off. Um, so I'd work an AFD, which obviously stands for a full day, but got changed to all fucking day. Um, so I'd do open until close on a, a Sunday and a Monday. I'd have Tuesdays and Wednesdays off. And then on a Thursday, I'd do three till close. Um, and then on a Friday, I'd do the open. So I'd do something like nine till seven. And then on a Saturday, I'd have to do uh, an AFD again um, or a split shift. Um, which a split shift that's just when people do that that's uh, that's soul destroying that is absolutely soul destroying i just think it makes it even more incredible when people do get to kind of like management level in pubs because it's such a hard career mate i don't know if it's probably changed a bit now but back then like i remember when i if you wanted to be like team leader or assistant manager you had to put the hours in yeah 100 percent. busy all the time you had like uh Sometimes you'd have pressures of people like your mates were doing like electricians' jobs, working nine to five, Monday to Friday. Yeah, smash the weekend and you'd yeah, be working they, all week. You they weren't go, having fun. You can't go to <laughs> anything unless you book it off, and it, it's such a mad career choice. Like, but you you just thought, oh, this is it for me. Like. I think I think for me because I was because I was always a very sociable person, always liked going out. I think this this became the perfect job for me because it was like I was out every night. You know, especially when I became an assistant manager, um, all of a sudden, you know, you don't have to spend your whole time just solely on the bar. You know, you're going around and you're running other parts of the business. So you go in and making sure everything's okay with the door team and you're making sure the glass collectors are okay. You're making sure the bar staff are okay. You're making sure everything's stocked up. You know, you're um, removing floats from the tills, you know, skimming the tills. I'll be honest, quite a lot of times I was just spending time with the DJ, like just having a, having a laugh up there and... Going around checking on all the all the um, all the guests that were in the pub, and you know making sure that they're having a good time and everything like that. So all of a sudden, then you're just walking around. Although I'm doing 65, 70 hours a week for very little money, I'm walking around and, and, and doing all that. But then networking comes in. So then all of a sudden, especially when you're working on somewhere like Broad Street, you finish work at you know, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, you know, you might be, you, you might have been quiet, so you might be able to pinch a couple of hours and finish at midnight, and you walk down to the next bar, or I used to go to Ministry of Sound that was at the church on Broad Street, and I go down there, and obviously we got to know the, the management team there, we got to know the management team at Walkabout, and at Bakers, Studi Bakers, places like that, you go in there until five, six o'clock in the morning, when they're closed, and b- because the management knew you, you'd automatically go into the VIP area. They'd probably just steal a bottle of vodka out of their stock, stick that on your table, have a good night. As long as you didn't go to the same place every single week, you know, you could, you could eventually, f- three nights a week, you could basically drink for free for yeah. three nights a week every week. <laughs> Which, you know, that... you did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was... Uh, that was... I know, yeah. This is what's given me a, a problem in later on in life, I suppose. <laughs> 
I think uh, it takes a special kind of person to do this industry or work in this industry, I should say. It feels like, I think you had it, I had it a little bit. You kind of take energy from the energy of the crowd in the pub, yeah. the people you work with, that energy. You feed off that, the tiredness just disappears. Your yeah. feet are sore, you don't care. You just worry about when you get into bed and your feet are knackered. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. While you're working and it's busy, man, and it, you get like a real adrenaline, don't you, from the the, the guests, as yeah, you Yeah, 100%. Percent. I think it's definitely a young person's uh, game as well, like because you, you just have that abundance of energy. I mean, from f- for me, from the ages of, you know, 18 to maybe 30, you know, that's why you could go on them holidays. <laughs> yeah, but, but 18 to 30's club was, was perfect for bar work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely amazing. You can run around, you've got an abundance of energy. Your body doesn't really give a crap what you eat, so you just <laughs> eat what you wanted, when you wanted, and, and yeah, go out and then, you know everything that ensued with it so everything that you think of in nightclubs and, and pubs that's what bar staff do and did and just went crazy for it and yeah. you, you know i think now the the change to now is just unbelievable they're polar opposites you look at it today you can't you can't run a pub or or, or i don't know about nightclubs obviously i wouldn't, wouldn't dream of <laughs> working that late at night <laughs> um, but yeah, you couldn't. You, I don't think you could run a pub or a nightclub or a, or anything like that the same way that we used to be able to get away with doing it then. Like not at all. Not at all. People had just complained too much. Now I have. If I if I wrote a somebody on um, a close on a Friday, um, which obviously uh, let's take these ridiculous COVID times out of it. Let's just yeah, yeah. talk last year. So Friday would close at one. So the team would be finished by half past one. Yeah. Mm. Um, because we'd not normally be that busy between 12 and 1 here. Um, so the team would be finished at half one. If you This is at Bacchus. So we'll just Bacchus, let everyone Bacchus, know. Bacchus, yeah. yeah. We're in Bacchus now. <laughs> if you uh, then wrote somebody on at 10 o'clock in the morning, primarily so they could then have the Saturday night off. They've worked on a Friday night. You've wrote them on Saturday morning so they could have a, a, you know the night off. Mm. The first thing that they would say to me was, oh, I've only got eight and a half hours break here. I should have 11 by, by law, by employment law. And you go, all right, sound, yeah, no problem, I'll change it. So then you change it and you put them on a 12.10. And then they'd be like, but I did Friday night, so I don't want to do Saturday night. You're like, yeah, but you also want 40 hours a week. So if I was to only give you a 12.7, you'd then moan at me that you've only got 37 hours. This is a new problem, you would say. <laughs> I'd say this is this yeah this is this is more new now. I mean back in my day, you know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> sound like an old guy. But but back then, you know, you, no one give a no one give a shit, mate. No, no one cared. You could wrote a someone on five nights in a week and they wouldn't complain, or you could wrote a someone on three nights in a week and make them come in early on those other two days. But it'd be after doing a close, mm-hmm. so they'd probably only have seven or eight hours rest. And they would literally kiss you. They'd be like, so thankful. Oh, my God, you've given me that night off. That is unbelievable. Cheers. Thanks for that. I don't remember him, like, even dreaming of employment law working at <laughs> bars. So I was like, as long as I get Tuesday and Wednesday, yeah. hit me. And <laughs> anything, I'm fine. I know, that's it. But now, I mean, I'm not saying people shouldn't have rights. People should definitely oh, yeah. have those rights, like 100%. You know, what we did back in the day was, was, was wrong. You know, making people, f- people like me, on 11 and a half grand a year, working 65, 70 hours a week, it was just, it was insane, absolutely insane. And we just did the best, you know, we did the best we could. I did less hours than, than my general manager, Chris, constantly did the most amount of hours. You know, he was always there and th- he, his work ethos is second to none. I've never known anything like it in my life. You know, he would not give anybody a job that he was not prepared to do himself. That was, yeah. you know, leading from the front, was was the prime example of how to run a pub including the bouncers yeah 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 that's it yeah yeah that's it <laughs> the amount of times you'd see chris dragging people out <laughs> and Even like a quiet wednesday afternoon yeah. what's that noise oh it's chris dragging someone down the stairs and sends a lot of throwing them out i mean fucking hell people think i'm temperamental jesus <laughs> that guy <laughs> hi chris if you're listening <laughs> What kind of hours do people work now? Like, can you still expect to work 60, 70 hours? No, no, not at all. So, to be fair, companies have got it bang on. I think um, there there, there might be out there, there might be some local backstreet boozers 
um, or some good restaurants where people are expected to work more. But obviously me being, you know, uh, let's say the corporate angle of, of this pub style, um, the way that a company like Mitchell's and Butler's or even Weatherspoons or any company out there, the way that they do it is they stick to the 48 hours. Mm -hmm. the, the, the rotor systems that we use, basically they flag up if anybody does over 48 hours, if anybody doesn't have two days rest or um, if they don't have 11 hours between the shifts. The 11 hours between the shifts kind of like a, you know, like an amber flag. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're kind of like, we understand why that might happen. So that's... That's fine, um, but if it, it's it's only okay if the person that you're rotoring on for that is okay with it. So here, my assistant managers, they do 48 hours a week. I mean, fortunately for them, they've got me as a boss, <laughs> and uh, so that I don't mind if they finish early or start late. You know, d depending on what the business is like, mm. depends how busy it is, doesn't it? It swings and roundabouts. So. There are occasions well they'll, where they'll do 55, maybe 60 hours in a week. But then 100%, the week after, they'll only be rotated on for four days. You know, they'll get an extra day off. They'll only have to do 35 hours that following week. Yeah. Um, because we can work it like that. We've got a big team. Mm. Um, I'm notorious for making sure that I have more shift supervisors and more assistant managers than maybe I need. Mm. Um, but that's because I like training people. I like developing people. I like pushing people. I like... I like it when I see people go off and, you know, have their own pub because I think, well, yeah. I've done that, you yeah, know. That's, yeah, um, so that, that's kind of replaced the the whole teenage buzz, like the 18 to 30 was the whole yeah, buzz of the whole it, yeah. Saturday night getting smashed. And yeah, yeah, and now getting smashed and pulling birds and now it's investing, in investing time and, and effort into people and, and training them and I, I absolutely adore it, to be honest. It's, it's my favourite thing. Because there's a lack of kind of managers coming through. Yeah. And, yeah. I, th I see it now, um, just just in my world, you know, you see that there's so many pubs out there that they don't invest, the manager doesn't invest time into other people, into people below them. I don't know whether they get wrangled up and they think that it's too hard, but for me, I mean, I am the epitome of lazy, I believe now. Um, th that's, uh, that's my excuse anyway. I don't think I am lazy, but what I do is... I make sure that as many people know how to do my job as possible so then I don't need to do it. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can do that is by investing time and training them. But then that works out really well, not just for me, but for the, for the district, for the other Nicholson's pubs in Birmingham, because they obviously get to steal shift supervisors or assistant managers if, they're, if they need cover, if they need help, or basically if, they, you know, if their assistant manager leaves and they need another assistant manager, then I've got four ready-made assistant managers here, you know, that, that they literally just need that role to step into. Yeah. Do you wish it was more, seen more as a career choice as well? Like, but obviously people who are working as like just part-time bar staff and stuff, but like also like at higher places like the government, like we don't want to get too deep into <laughs> how they're treating the hospitality. Let's, and let's the not go into it. politics today. Jesus. But, it's not it's just still seen as like just the little place where you go and work while you're learning your career doing something else or i think why can't it be the career like no like in america yeah it, there's a bit of a prestige to be a barman it is yeah yeah being a bartender is a really good job yeah. in america um i think it's getting there it's it is changing um i think the government have um put certain things in into place um, which which are helping our sector, um, not 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 at the moment, you know, not since July. <laughs> um, but I mean, like you know, they they they'd um, put apprenticeships in place, so basically they pay the wages of, of apprentices that we employ, um, which is just absolutely fantastic. Um, with a company like Mitchells and Butlers, you know, the the training that it has, the systems that it's got in place um, to further people's careers and to to help people make this as a career choice is outstanding, absolutely outstanding. The apprenticeship, I mean, I've got, I've got a girl that works for me. She's a shift supervisor, her name's Grace. Um, she's a shift supervisor here. She started with us, I think when she was 16, as an apprentice at the old Contemptibles when I was with the manager there. Um, so she completed her apprenticeship. It was a two year apprenticeship. I think she smashed that out of the park within about a year and a half. Obviously I kept her on. 
Um, and then when I moved to Bacchus, um, I asked her to move with me. Normally, I don't take anyone. I, I, I don't like that. I don't like stripping teams apart mm. that I'd taken all that time to build. Mm. I, wanted, I want the pub to do as good, if not better, when I leave than it was doing when I was there. I like to go in and fix pubs rather yeah. than you know, rather than ride the wave. I'll ride the wave for a little bit, but then I get bored. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I, I, I brought her here with me. She's now a shift supervisor. She's completed all of her assistant manager training. Um, and she is literally now just waiting to become an assistant manager. Um, she's in no rush. She wants to stay with me for as long as possible. Um, that's what she says to you. That's what she says to <laughs> you. Yeah, she's probably applying left, right and centre. But no, I, well, there's not many jobs out there either at the moment. But um, I think, yeah, she, she does. She wants, to, she wants to take her time and get it right. Um, big head on her, on her shoulders, to be honest. She's doing well. Oh, that's brilliant. But it's weird, like, it's fascinating to me because I, w I don't know if I just lost touch with the whole pub side of the hospitality industry. Like, we were probably, I was probably guilty of being too focused on restaurants, you know, because I love restaurants and stuff. Yeah. And obviously, working in pubs, maybe I, there was a part of me that thought I already knew it all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause, because you've worked in a pub. Yeah, yeah. And then it didn't even dawn on me that all these restaurants we've been chatting to in, like, head chefs like Luke Tipping and all it. Everyone's saying, oh, the industry's changed so much. You know, when every, it's notorious, everyone remembers the old um, boiling point Ramsey days of, yeah. the, of the kitchen. It never dawned on me, like, or oh, maybe pubs have changed as well. So when, yeah. we, when you told me that a few weeks ago, I thought, it clicked in my hand. I was like, why wouldn't it have? That, of yeah, course yeah. it has. <laughs> well, and honestly, for looking back at how, how it was, you know, compared to how it, how it is now, I mean, fucking hell, I remember, you know, general managers of, of mine, yeah, they lose their shit with you. I remember them sacking people on the spot, behind the bar. You know, you've just caught someone stealing. You've literally just caught someone taking money out of a till and putting it in their pocket. Why the hell are you going to go through the rigmarole of going through a disciplinary? You know, you've just seen them do it, right? Put that fucking money back and fuck off out my pub, you know? But you, obviously, you can't do that now. And I think everything, everything has changed. And I, I, I get where people... Now, you know, older people, people of my generation, people of generations prior to me, sometimes they look at people and, yeah, the, the word melt is banded around quite a lot, isn't it? Or snowflake. And, uh, and yeah, you look, at, you look at some of these some of these bar staff, some of these kids out there, and you think, yeah, yeah, you're, you're that word there. You're a melt. Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't want anything to happen. I mean, fortunately for me, because I've seen the old school way of doing things and I've done it the old school way I mean you know after working for me at Weatherspoons <laughs> Jesus Christ man temperamental is to throw cutlery at people <laughs> if they've not done their job properly but I uh, here for instance now I can still shout at people I can still swear at people obviously I'm not meant to um, but I think if you, you kind of get to know the person that you're managing and there are people that I work with here that work better if they get bollocked. Mm. And uh, there are people that work better if you put your arm around them and, 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 and cushion them that way. Obviously, everybody works better when they do a good job and they get praised. Mm. And I think the reward and recognition part is, for me personally, I think that's the biggest part of, of this job now. Mm. I think everyone knows that they get paid shit wages. In this country, you don't get tipped for doing a good job, or you very rarely get tipped for doing a good job. The service charge piece is is massive as well. Um, with our company now, we've just gone through a, a bit of a silly new policy um, where we're not allowed to charge service charge for anything less than a table of six people. But obviously, you can't take so you know. It, uh, do six people live together anymore, you know? <laughs> so you don't have tables of six coming in, so basically we're not allowed to add service charge. Yeah. Um, so therefore, the, 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 the staff, the team, sorry, they don't, they don't really get any other reward apart from the reward that I can give them. And there is so many times that I know what pulls my cord. I know what makes me want to work harder. And as a general manager, I love nothing more in winning awards and you know going onto a stage and <laughs> obviously talking <laughs> as you know 
Um, but I love nothing more than that. But I love, I think I love the competitive edge. So I love it if I go to a district meeting and my area manager turns around and goes, right, you know, th- this person has showed, you know, pride in his pub and uh, he's developed these people and he's done this job and, you know, he's a, he's a case of beer to Brendan. Um, I love nothing more than that. And, and so I think, well, my team would love nothing more than that then. So surely I need to make sure that that's mirrored all the way down. So... I praise my team as much as I can. I reward them as much as I can, even if it's just 10 quid on a gift card. You know, you can only spend it in a Mitchell's and Putler's place, but bloody hell, you all drink here. So. Yeah, there's a few of them. Yeah, exactly. So just drink here and have it. It sounds like, like for me, uh, emotional intelligence, probably your best asset as a manager. Yeah, 100%. Is that something you've always had or something you've worked on or... Uh, well, you tell me. You you work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so. Yeah, I would I'd, say so. I'd say that I um I get to know people. I get to know people I work with. There are a lot of uh, again there are a lot of general managers out there that they know their people to a certain degree, um but don't know them much more than that. I think what I used to do is I used to make the mistake of I got to know people a little bit too well. So I'd go drinking with them a little bit too often and. And then the problem is then if they phone in sick the next day, you're like, oh, hold on a minute. Why are you phoning in sick? I know that you're out drinking with me until four o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. And they'd probably be like, yeah, but you were buying me shots all night and I am in no state to come into work. <laughs> so, you know, it was a, it was a bit of a, a, a two-edged sword. Um, but now I think, yeah, what, what I do is on purpose, I get to know the people that I work with. I sit down and have meetings with them, you know, even just a coffee in the morning, just to chat with them in the office when they can, um, you know, without bollocking them, you know, just get to know them as much as you can. So then, so then all of a sudden, you know, what gift you're going to buy them if they do something well. Um, And honestly, just putting a bit of thought into, you know, well, I've got that, you know, I've got a person that works for me and, and, and she's vegan. So, right, I need to make sure that I buy her something that is along those vegans lines. And, you know, I can't just buy her a, a beer that I'd buy everyone else, mm. you know, or uh, whatever, so or a cake, uh, I don't know. So you, you just have to you have to really invest in the people that you have working for you. My ethos is quite simple. The way I've run every pub, and I have never been unsuccessful in a pub. Mm. I've always I've always left the pub a lot better than when I got there, without a shadow of a doubt. I agree. Um, and. I think my main ethos is what I want is I want guests to give us good reviews. Mm. For me, uh, I know that everyone hates TripAdvisor, let's be honest about this. You know, everyone that works in the industry absolutely despises TripAdvisor because you you get people that believe that they are a critic and they come and critique your service, your bar, your restaurant, your pub, whatever it is. And they tell you the things that maybe you don't want to know. Um, sorry, go on. Surely that's a good thing. It is a good thing, 100%. People don't like it, though. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, the, sure. the reason why people don't like TripAdvisor is because they don't want to be told their flaws. They don't yeah. want to be told where they're going wrong. And sometimes people are just dishonest. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes you know. people are absolute yeah. pricks. People just write something that's completely dishonest. Yeah. Yeah. But I think... As someone who reads TripAdvisor quite often, you can see through it straight away. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, like Salt's famous. You know, Salt in Stratford Haven. Yeah, yeah. Paul Foster is famous for the uh, TripAdvisor stuff. He had someone. He said the the uh, owner chef came and exposed himself to my <laughs> crack and stabbed friend to stab her with a steak knife. <laughs> Obviously, reading that, you're like, that didn't happen. No, that didn't, definitely didn't <laughs> no, happen. No one in their right mind believed. That. <laughs> no, but then. If someone, it, if it comes up fairly often, oh, well, this part of the interior was a little bit shabby. If that comes up fairly often, it's yeah. probably true. Well, th- th- this is it. So my ethos is, I w- what I want is I want guests to constantly come here and leave us good reviews. And the reason why I want them to leave good reviews is because I know if they're happy, they're going to come back. And repeat business is worth, you know, more money than than trying to get new business. If you can, if you can, make somebody or make somebody if you can get somebody to come back after they visited once then bam you've, you've nailed it you've absolutely nailed it so for me the way the only way you can do that is by creating the perfect team 
there's no such thing as a perfect team. Obviously, everybody has flaws, and some uh, some team members that you have or managers that you have um, have bigger flaws than others. Mm. And it's about as a manager, it's about how do you make sure they don't expose their flaws anymore? How do you make people work together? And and it's all about strengths. And uh, you know, everyone hears the aces in places and stuff like that, yeah. which I hate. I hate all of that. But in turn, it does work. And I think if you can get the perfect team or a close to a perfect team where you know that that person isn't very good at doing restaurant service, mm. they're amazing on the bar, but that person is crap on the bar, they are great at glass collecting, and that person is good at that. If you can then, when you're doing your rota, because you've got to know those people and you work with those people, you can make sure that you're not having, you know, for, he, for instance, here on a Saturday where last year we were doing 20 grand every Saturday, you couldn't, I couldn't have just 14 members of bar staff. It's impossible. Yeah. You know, I'd need four people that are amazing in a restaurant. I'd need three people that are amazing at glass collecting. I'd need 10 people that are, are brilliant behind the bar, etc. Yeah. And then, And then what you do is you, you work that and you make sure that people aren't having breaks at the same time together and and et cetera, et cetera, it's, it, it's quite complex. But then if you can then pass on your ethos to everybody in that team, that the guest comes first, mm. and people don't come into a restaurant, pub, anything, they don't come there to complain. Nobody does. Nobody. Mm, okay. Somebody does. Some people. I'd say, yeah, okay, maybe. But if you're talking, if you're talking how many, Small you've majority. you've got to think Small it's probably one in a thousand, you know, oh, yeah. it, it, and and that's that's the point. So yeah, so if you all of a sudden it's zero point one percent of your guest base is actually going in to complain, well, you shouldn't worry about that because that is such a minute part of it. You should worry about the ninety nine point nine of people, yeah. ninety nine point percent of people that want to go in and have a good time. Go on. But I was going to say I think. That's human nature, and that's one of the flaws of internet and social media and TripAdvisor in general. In that we, you, you may have, like we may have put a post up that gets like a hundred likes uh, and twenty comments, all saying how brilliant it is. Or we get twenty DMs, how good the podcast is. We get one DM that says, "I, did, I thought this was a bit shit," and then you dwell on the one. Yeah, you, you do. You forget about the other twenty that were brilliant. The one you're like, oh fucking no. And I think uh, going back to Paul Foster. He's never read out any of the reviews that said how brilliant Salt is. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's given all the attention to all the shit ones. And I think that's just human nature. I think that's what we all do. Yeah. Um, so I think that kind of re-emphasizes your point there. Yeah, well, well that's it. I think, I think, first of all, what you need to do is you need to try and make sure that you're not giving anybody a reason to complain. One of the things that I'm going to hate saying this now because it's going to massage your frigging ego. But if you look through the TripAdvisor reviews for Bacchus... Like a lot of the headlines is service or fantastic yeah. service. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I think, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it does my ego yeah, a little bit. Yeah, if yeah. Anybody out there that knows <laughs> me, I'm very egotistical. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I am. Um, well, that, but, but that's the one thing that I've always, always concentrated on. So we have obviously WhatsApp groups. Um, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't have any Facebook groups anymore. Uh, but we have WhatsApp groups, and that's how we communicate. That's how I communicate predominantly I think with the team and um, obviously especially in COVID times you can't particularly have team meetings anymore or go out on the piece with other people that aren't part of your household and I don't work with any I don't work with my six-year-old daughter um, so what I have to do is I have to communicate some way and what I've done for the past since since Weatherspoons, I've changed I learned things at Weatherspoons that uh, that taught me how to work in a pressurized environment massively um, because they are so busy all of the time um, it's like the McDonald's of the pub world isn't it let's be honest it's cheap it's cheerful everyone knows what they're getting but it's a, a very stressful environment to work in yeah. so since I've come to Nicholson's and and managed the old contemptibles in here obviously I know what I'm doing and I know how I want to do it so my ethos is basically we're not allowed to get negative reviews mm. and, and that is that simple we are not allowed to get negative reviews. So I have turned around to my team and said, you make sure that that guest, every guest, 
is happy before they leave this pub. Mm. So obviously, even if they're just coming in for a drink, you know, you want to make sure that you're serving them in time. There are certain flashpoints that people will force people to put a negative review in. So for instance, they might walk in and it might be a, a, you know, a 15 minute wait at the bar. So they're waiting, they're, they're waiting patiently. They get to the bar and they put their arm on the bar and they put it in a puddle of lager. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing more. It pisses you off more than that yeah. in your nice going out shirt. Mm. Yeah, so then you're like, fuck's sake. Then the bar staff ignores you and they serve the person next to you, either side of you, before serving you, even though you were at the bar first. That's pissed you off a little bit, yeah? Then you ask for a drink and they say, oh, we haven't got that. And they go, all right, okay. So they ask for another drink and uh, the, you give them the drink that they want um, but you've only put two cubes of ice in, so that's not going to cool their drink down. It's just going to melt and make their drink taste crap. So they then go back to their table. They're a bit annoyed. Their table still hasn't been cleared from the previous guests that have been there. They're even more annoyed. They go to the toilet. There's no toilet paper. There's no soap. The hand dryer doesn't work. All of these little things, they might not all happen in one go, but all of them are flashpoints, and they are what drive somebody to not have a good time the pub might be amazing. You might be in the best pub in the world with the best atmosphere in the world and the best service in the world. But if you go into the toilet and there's no toilet paper, you are leaving a crap review. I don't, I don't give a shit what, this, what anyone says. If you've got to take your sock off, <laughs> <laughs> you are leaving a terrible review. So yeah, so for me, that is what I've always worked on. I've always made sure that m we're checking the toilets that we're serving people in order, that we're wiping the bar down, you know, that we're putting plenty of ice in drinks. All of these little things that myself or you like when you go out and you expect when you go out to a, you know, a top class restaurant, an amazing bar. I'm not saying Bacchus is the best bar in the world, but, you know, recently we've just made it into the, uh, the top 100 of places to eat on TripAdvisor in Birmingham. Made that last week. So for me, that's what well, we're doing something right. When I took over... Um, we were like outside the top 1,000. Yeah. So I think if you just make sure that then you're listening to what the guests are saying. So do you like do you encourage the staff to go up and say to them, like, is everything okay? Yeah. Do you do it more than once, not the obligatory, like, wait until they've got a mouthful of food? Yeah, yeah. Just just say, like, is everything right with food? Yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> you it. Go I, a couple of times, yeah. I think, I think people... It's the way you ask people as well. I don't want you ask? I don't want somebody to give you a yes or no answer. So I don't want to say, is everything okay with your food? Yeah. Plus, if you say, is everything okay? You're basically saying, is everything average with your food? I'm accepting, I am accepting average today. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think we should do that. So it's simple. How's your food? Yeah. You know, yeah. How's, how's your experience? Yeah. How do you like Bacchus? Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's what we want to ask people and that's how we want to get it out of people one of the best i'd heard i can't remember where it was but they said to me uh, was there anything we could have done better today yeah that's good and straight away i'm like i don't know yeah, yeah actually no it's pretty good yeah <laughs> it's that's really good. good actually and, uh, like i'm fairly i probably wouldn't complain even if there was something wrong yeah but somebody else would like yeah, somebody yeah. at that point if you've asked them that and they had a genuine problem that you hadn't noticed, and then they'll probably mention it then and not go on TripAdvisor and yeah, you say it. Yeah, 100%. We, um, we recently had... So we get, we get reviews on, on obviously, all bases. Um, there's, a, there's a thing that Mitchells and Butler's use called reputation.com, and what that does is it feeds in all of your reviews and all of your social media activity into one place. So you can just go onto that one place. It's easy to manage. It's easy to look at. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally... Um, I'm like the, the guest champion, as it were, for the brand, for Nicholson's, um, because I am focused on that aspect of it and always have been. Um, so I know that your web footprint is massive. Um, so whether it's social media or your reviews, you've got to make sure that you're getting them uh, and you're getting good ones. Um, so we had a review recently. Um, they gave us a four. It wasn't on TripAdvisor, it was on... Uh, design my night because we use um, we use that system for, for our booking system mm -hmm. um, and it, it basically said um, great place great atmosphere service was fantastic um, they forgot to bring our nachos out um, so what had happened was obviously somebody had ordered a starter mm -hmm. we completely the, the, the person that was serving them it's obviously full table service at the moment um, so the person that was service, serving them obviously just forgot to put it on the till 
don't know, don't know how it happened. So they didn't get their starter. So obviously, um, the server took their mains out. The guest said, oh, well, we asked for a starter. So the server's gone, oh, I'm really, really sorry about that. Let me take your mains back. I'll get your fresh mains made up and I'll get your, your starter made. And they went, okay. So they did that, obviously, because they had to wait a little bit longer. What my server then did was they obviously didn't charge them for the nachos, but bought them a round of drinks as well mm -hmm. um, and gave them 20% off their food. So I think that that, for me, is perfect. Well, you know, the guest has got a problem. You've literally appeased that problem straight away. The server then asked the guest, is there anything else you'd like me to do? And the guest obviously was like, no, no, I'm over the moon. Like, I can't believe you've given me a discount, given me a free drink, given me a free starter, just for a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, so they obviously left us a, a four-star review where, in other worlds, that could have been a one-star because you, you would go into some bars, some pubs, as you know, and you'd put their mains down and they'd go, oh, we did order a starter, and the server would go, oh, I'm sorry about that, and walk off. And walk off, yeah. yeah. Which happens. It but does. That's, <laughs> that's obviously something that, and uh, I'll be honest with you, that used to happen here. Mm. That used to happen here before I got here. That used to happen here whilst I first started here. And I was absolutely disgusted because I was like, would you do that to your, you know, to your parents, to your grandparents? A member of your family came in, would you do that to them or would you then go, no, nah, well, fucking hell, man, that's my brother. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm taking their meals away. I'll get him fresh meals and I'll get him a new starter. That's what you do to your family. So why wouldn't you do that to somebody else's family? Mm, definitely. I think sometimes as well that, that's from management as well. So, like, you probably instilled on that member of staff, this is what you can do. Like, yeah. the, whereas if they if another manager's in and they haven't told them how to respond to that, then they might just think, oh, well, I'm not allowed to give away free food. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's <laughs> that's it. We, we have, we had um, team meetings every, every like, six weeks. So, I'd have a, I'd have a management meeting every couple of weeks. I'd have team meetings every six weeks. We always used to do the whole reward and recognition part on there. And w one of my main focuses on, on those team meetings, they're only an hour long, but, you know, God bless PowerPoints. I'd bore everyone with a PowerPoint presentation. But it's a good way to go through it. It's a good way to let your whole team know how the business is, is, is going, how the business part of the pub is going. They only see them coming in, pouring pints, taking food out to people, have people having a good time, and that's it. It's very rare that you get people showing you actually this is how much money we're making mm -hmm. this is our reviews this is what get that is what people think about us um mitchells and butlers have got a, a thing uh, called your say um which is, is basically a questionnaire that they send out every year to the staff so we know how the staff are feeling as well mm -hmm. um so all of that so you go through all of that and and when i started touching on the guest part of it you know i'd say that would take up half the meeting a minimum because what we were doing was we were going through reviews and I'd, I'd dissect reviews mm -hmm. and I'd be like this person has given us a one star do you think it's fair that they give us a one star and then you'd read out the review and people would be like oh bloody hell <laughs> now yeah you're right there are occasions where people give you a one star when not much was wrong you can spy them yeah, yeah. And, and look through their other reviews yeah, and it's done it. the same they're everywhere just, else they're just dickheads they're just a minority so I wouldn't worry too much yeah about them. 100% but but you know so we'd we'd concentrate on what we were doing well and if any negative reviews told us what we weren't doing so well then we'd dissect that and we'd concentrate on that and and to the point where if a negative review comes in if you if you were to leave me a negative review today then tonight I would see that review and I would screenshot that review and I would send that to the WhatsApp group and I'd be like I want to know who served this person I want to know everything about it. I want your side. This is your opportunity to tell me what you did for that guest. Mm -hmm. And yeah, quite a lot of times by investigating it, you find that actually the member of staff, they, they messed up. Yeah. And, and that's... You can take that and try and yeah, retrain. And exactly right. So then, you know, quite a lot of times it is a training issue. So you train that out of them and you make sure that doesn't happen again. I would say you use TripAdvisor the right way. Like that's how yeah. I, I believe it's such an important tool for the industry and one that's just dismissed so easily. Yeah. And it's criminal because <laughs> it will tell you if something's wrong, tell you if something's good. You can focus on that. You can retry and you can, you can deal with it. If someone just doesn't tell you anything, 
You've got no feedback. Like. Yeah, hundred. <laughs> well, that's it. You, you need you need feedback because you need to know how how well you're doing. I think moving on to your, you know touching on your point where you said I'm egotistical. That's another thing I like being told how well the the bar's doing, how well the pub is doing. How how does that affect how you deal with it? Because I love reading through your TripAdvisor replies. Like that's often as some of them are brilliant, and I wish more people would reply like how you reply. Yeah, and that. How do you deal with when you get a negative? Then, like, what do you, does that just oh, not ruin you? <laughs> mate, it used to it used to really ruin my day. It it, it, it sometimes I'd, it it it'd play on my mind. What well, I've got this nasty habit of what I do is I go onto um, this this reputation dot com. I, uh, I have the app on my phone, and uh, even on days off at night, I had a nasty habit of I'd go onto that last thing at night to see what reviews we had come through. And if we had a negative review, I, I, I couldn't sleep at night because I'd, I'd be thinking about how I'm going to respond to it. Mm. I think now I don't do that, obviously, because it was um, playing on my mental health far too much. Yeah. Um, and what I've, what I've purposefully done over the past year is I've made sure that I'm doing as many things as I possibly can to make sure that my mental health is in a stable position. Um, and because of that, I've obviously, you know, I, I don't go on the app at night. I only go on it when I'm uh, during working hours. Yeah. Um, and I think if we get a negative review come through, um, the advice that I give to anybody and, and what I do myself is just sleep on it. Yeah. Just go, go to, you know, have your day as normal. Think about it. Sleep on it. Report, respond the next day. You can see on TripAdvisor when somebody has responded straight away. And normally it's because the response is a fucking rant. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't help anything. It anyone. doesn't help anybody. Because yeah. effectively what you've done is you've spat your dummy out. You're, telling, you're trying to tell the world, actually, this guest is a prick. <laughs> but what you're doing is you, you, you're playing over the same things and you, you type really quickly and you type aggressively. And then all of a sudden what you're actually showing the world is you've got no grammar. Your spelling is wrong. <laughs> so actually <laughs> people look and go, well, do you know what? They're, the manager's an idiot. He's not, he's not put his side across. Whereas if you at least go to sleep on it and then go the next day and, and, and respond. Quite a lot of times, and I mean this, quite a lot of times I've had re, I've, I've put responses on for one stars where I've gone, I completely hold my hands up. We were, we were massively in the wrong that day. We completely messed up your booking. That We have no excuses, you know. And that, that has happened. Yeah. But then, yeah, uh, you know, uh, other times I've actually gone on and just gone there. <laughs> I think it's, it's brilliant, right. and I think it, as I said, it, it just makes it such a useful tool, and it's one that you should be using all the time. And it, like it or not, people do check TripAdvisor before yeah. coming to a, a pub or a restaurant. Yeah, so I, I, you I, I, as well use it. I completely agree. I've just been a, uh, just come back from a few days in the Lake District with the wife, and uh, and yeah, I've never been never been to Windermere before. Mm. Um, so I went on to TripAdvisor to find out where's best for me to, to to go and eat, and I think if you go on and you see that you know an owner business owner or a manager or whatever is actively responding to guests on there then you know that they care and then you yeah. know that that place is going to be good yeah it's, it's that simple if yeah. you ignore it these days if you completely and utterly ignore trip advisor well do you know what you're not you, you're not running your business whether it's your own pub whether you're a manager of it you know whether it's a big corporate machine it doesn't matter what if you if you're not responding to those reviews, then you may as well not not respond to guests in your pub. If they turn around and say there's a problem with this meal, then you may as well just go. I don't give a fuck, mate. Piss off. But that's the uh, the problem with the internet and social media and stuff. Like when you've got a guest now in your pub, you're not serving one person. You've got the potential of serving like a thousand people in that one guest yeah 100 their photos on instagram yeah, yeah. their trip advisor reviews their post on facebook that's it all of a sudden it, it changes everything when they, when they <laughs> stick a photograph of a meal that they've had and put it together with a review and they're time stamping it and they're putting it mm. you know for, for your pub you haven't got you haven't got any get out clause there. There's no, nowhere nothing, to hide. No, there's nothing at all. So the only the only thing that you have got is to be able to respond to it. But that's why for me, my ethos is we cannot let that happen in the first place. The yeah. only way you can let that you can stop that. Sorry, the only way you can stop that is by making sure that the people that work for you, the people that are serving the guests, are actually going over to them and saying, 
what was wrong today yeah you know and that's it and 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 what can we do to turn this service around i think you know if you ask a hundred people that are making a complaint if you ask a hundred of them what can i do to turn this situation around i think you'd probably only get one maybe two people that would go give it me all for free yeah (coughs) i think generally most of them would say give me a new meal yeah buy me a round of drinks I'll have a free dessert, you know, and these things don't cost, they don't cost no, hundreds no. of thousands of pounds. They're not going to dent your profit, but not in any way. But then that one negative review, that one bad photo, that could... That will dent your profit. Yeah, it like will. Could uh, one, turn 100 people away. Yeah, yeah, well, 100%. Not 100, but maybe 10. Yeah, but, well, that's it. And, and, and then especially then, you know, if you're then ranting and saying that the guest was wrong and, you know, even though they've got photos to back it up, if you're then saying, now nah, you're a prick, mate, on TripAdvisor, then other people that come on TripAdvisor will look at that and go, I don't, I don't like that business. I don't need that in my life. I'm yeah, not going there. I'm not going there. I'm not going there because I don't want to get into an argument with the, with the manager just for making a complaint because they've undercooked my burger. Also, I think with going back to the table and checking with the person face to face, we can see by Twitter, people are a lot nicer face to face. Yes. If they're on the online or on tw- TripAdvisor, people behind a screen can be a lot more nasty. Oh my God. Fa- Facebook <laughs> reviews, obviously, they you can you can you can respond to a Facebook review and then they can respond back. <laughs> and then and what, what I found is if you have a negative review on there. People are just arguing. You just see, you just see managers arguing with a with a customer, and you're like, "Why are you arguing with them? Just, <laughs> just stop replying. Stop. <laughs> just just <laughs> say like your piece. Them. Yeah, <laughs> just say your piece and fuck it off. Delete it." <laughs> <laughs> I was going to move on now to how COVID's affected and the whole city centre, but I think we we'll, we'll, let, yeah, let's touch on it. Yeah, I think it's important because you're a city centre boozer and or a city centre hospitality business. And I feel like I work, we've got a job in town, so I'm in town fairly often. And driving even into town, any oh, time it's of so the day, quiet. it's still a ghost town. Yeah, it's unreal. I think I think blaming hospitality, This is they're not coming out and, you know, straight blaming hospitality. They're not doing that, obviously. Nobody's doing that. But when they're, the way that they're penalising hospitality at the moment is just next level. I think if you look at it and you go, well, hold on a minute, sending students back to university, that's possibly what is causing this second spike. I would say you will look back on that fact and think back to like probably the care home incident in the yeah. first and then the universities in the second. Yeah. The two biggest mistakes of this whole... Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. I think turning around and saying... You know, you're not allowed to uh, meet your friends in in hospitality anymore. Uh, well, specifically tier two. Um, you, you closing the pubs at, at ten o'clock at night. What what genius thought that I know what we'll do? We'll have all of these city centres that every bar is full of people. Every seat is taken up in every single bar. That you know, there's thousands of people in these city centres. I know what we'll do. We'll stop COVID spreading by making sure that they're all in the same place at five past ten every night. You know, I've seen it in Birmingham. <coughs> Excuse me. I've seen it in Birmingham where people are sharing taxis. You know, where are you going? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to Harborn. Oh, I live near Harborn. I'll jump in your taxi. They don't know each other. They're not wearing masks. They're you know, not from the same household. they're definitely not from the same household. <laughs> yeah, and, they're, and, and that's OK. You know, that's OK to do. It doesn't matter. People partying in the streets, yeah. hugging each other, pissed up, going back to house parties, everything like that. That's all that this has created. Whereas if you just said, keep it on. I think the uh, I was talking to the, uh, one of the managers in Birmingham City Centre and he said that he'd had a visit from their licensing officer or from somebody from the licensing. And they'd said to him, this was the first weekend that we had to close at 10. Yeah, so they'd said to him, what time are you closing? Tomorrow. Uh, and he said, well, 10 p.m. We've got to close at 10 p.m. because we've been told to. And he said, the licensing officer said, do you not think, think that that's really irresponsible because everybody on this road, so it's on um, on Temple Street going up. So um, he said, everyone, you know, Rev de Cuba, Las Iguanas, Head of Steam, the Botanist, uh, Ivy, uh, Trocadero, all of them are all kicking out at 10 o'clock. Do you not think it's really ir- irresponsible that you're closing at 10? And he said, no, nah, well, it's not my fault. Boris Johnson's made me do it. At the moment, we're all 
we're, we're all kind of like prawns with button feeders at the moment. We're trying to get scraps to, you know, to, to run our businesses. I mean, let's just touch on backers, for instance. So this, this time last year, we were doing 45, 50 grand a week. Yeah. Yeah. This week, we've had a good week and we're going to do 14 grand. And that's a good week. Nice. Yeah. That's how much trade we've lost. I get that we're, you know, got the backing of a, a massive multi-million pound corporation, mm -hmm. which a massive multi-million pound corporation, which I will say um, that in June was probably two weeks away from completely going under and closing its doors and making 45,000 people redundant. Yeah. Um, these are these are people that work for me. These are people that you know you know in the, in the trade. Everyone's you know part of a family. It's not just students that work in in bars. Yeah. I've got mothers. You know, mm -hmm. I've I've got people that that rely on 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 this job and on this money, of course. Um, and I think now we're still at the stage where Mitchells and Butlers have just announced redundancies. I don't know how many we've we've made across the whole whole business. Um, I've had to make people redundant here, which is without a shadow of a doubt the hardest thing that I've ever had to do in my career. Yeah, because even though, you, you, obviously you said about you got the backing of a massive Mitchells and Butlers, big company, it doesn't feel like, I, I know firsthand from working in, like when we worked for Weatherspoons, it didn't feel like we were part of Weatherspoons until no. the uh, area manager or someone came along. Yeah. It felt like our little boozer. Yeah, it's it? our yeah. pub, yeah. This yeah. is the same. Yeah, it's, this is the same. This is your boozer. Yeah. And these staff, they're your staff. They're, they're my not, staff. They're not Mitchell and Butlers. No, I, I employed managers. all of them. I trained all of them, you know. I'm, yeah. I, I, I chose, each person that works here, I chose over, you know, a number of other applicants. And, and when you've got to get rid of someone. Oh, my it's, God. It's I, I tell you what, when you, when you have to sack someone because they've been stealing or because they've messed up or, you know, because they're constantly late or whatever it may be, whatever it may be. Well, do you know what? That I don't, I don't care. That, that I don't mind. I don't mind that yeah. because I think, well, they've fucked up. They're the ones that have messed up. They've done something that has forced me to dismiss them. Yeah, that's fine. When you're making somebody redundant, the only reason why you're getting rid of them is because there is not enough work available for them to do. Yeah. To, to have them. And you, as a manager, you have to make a choice. And you have to choose, do I choose this person or do I choose this person? That is, that is tough. That is tough, man. I can imagine. And it, it was, it, yeah, for me, it was, it was the hardest thing going and seeing people cry in front of you mm. because they don't know where they're going to be able to get the money from to feed themselves, you know. And that, that's appalling, absolutely appalling. And it's not like I've chosen people that are working and gone, well, they, they, they need 40 hours a week, so I'm giving them 40 hours a week. So therefore, I've got no hours for, for them. What I've done is I've had to, we've got no zero hour contracts here. Everyone That's is, good. yeah, everyone is contracted to a, to a minimum hours. So what I've had to do is I've had to revisit that and give everybody less hours. Yeah, mm -hmm. so recontract them effectively and, and maybe go down. <coughs> I've not done it with loads of people, but I've done it with, it with, with a fair few where I've had to say, do you know what, you're not going to be able to get those minimum hours anymore, but I can give you these minimum hours instead. And they're happy because they've still got a job. Yeah. You know? And obviously when when the pub gets, you know, when when COVID, it's not going to disappear, is it? Let's be honest. No. no it's never going to go. Like you know? We, we've got to live with it. Yeah. We're recording this on a Saturday. I feel like Monday there's some kind of announcement coming. Yeah, it looks like there's going to be a, a, a four-week lockdown or, or it's whatever. It's all confidence as well, isn't it? I mean, like, it's all right for the government to say, well, we didn't close hospitality or we didn't close the pubs. It's all well and good saying that, but you've kind of alienated the pubs and you've made the general public feel like, oh, there must be a problem with pubs or yeah, hospitality. Yeah. It's like it's saying I, 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 I didn't kill them. Um, I didn't kill them by pushing them down the stairs. It was gravity that killed them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I just gave them the initial shove. I'm going to be stealing that <laughs> <boat>. <laughs> But it's true, though, isn't it? You know, and, 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 that's, and that's what's happening. I think that, you know, doing the eat out to help out was a really good thing. But then to blame us for then the spread of, of COVID is ridiculous. And there's no way. They're, they're the safest places. In the world, and and you know, I, I was listening to your um, podcast uh, with uh, Andy Love and Slope. 
Yeah. Great guy. But at the start of the podcast, you and Carl were having a chat about um, about hospitality. And Carl said, apart from your house, they are the safest places in the world. I'd go even further than that and say, I think they're fucking safer than my house. It's funny you say that because I was thinking that. I was yeah. thinking, I don't know, man. I think I feel like I don't, a, I don't like do some... kitchen at... Um, Places of work, yeah, probably fucking yeah. Well, the kitchen, like. Even 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 front of house, you know. I don't disinfect where people have been sitting <laughs> in my own house. I haven't got a disinfectant spray where I'm spraying that down. I don't when I'm taking food out to my daughter. I don't wear a mask, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And 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 that's it. There's all of these yeah. little things that you know. All of the team are wearing masks. We've got disinfectant. We were using high temperature dishwashers and glass washers to make sure that any germs are, are, are disappearing. We've got hand sanitizer on the front door. We're telling people about rules. We're making sure that all of the tables and chairs are all socially distant from each other. So you can't share a table with somebody you don't know. But most of that was pre-COVID. Most the, of that was the pre-COVID. With all of yeah. that is all pre- of, D10. Yeah, We've yeah. always lived on D10. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the amount of cleaning that we do in, in, in pubs and bars and yet, yeah, you, you are literally, you are going into somewhere, and the people have always done this, always done always. it, always, gone into somewhere, and they're ordering food from somebody they don't know that could kill them. Mm-hmm. That food could kill you, like quite simply, but it doesn't, and why doesn't it? i tell you why it doesn't, because they are regularly checked. They are regularly checked, whether it's by EHO or if you've got a massive company like us, you know, we employ our own safety technicians. We employ a company called NSF. You have managers, you know, that that check. You've got due diligence records. You are making sure that all of that meat is probed. You're making sure that those fridges are segregated and all of the food is separated from each other. You're making sure you're using different fridges for different types of food. You know, everything like that. So that there is... No possible way of cross-contamination. Colour-coded chopping boards, colour-coded knives, everything. Day dots. Do you have a day dot at home? No. Have you ever day dotted your food? Have I you have ever one chopping board? I t- <laughs> yeah, I've got one chopping board, and there are so many times when I will open a tub of leftovers and go, <laughs> all right, that'll be all right. That's got that, another day in it. How many days? I don't, yeah. know. I don't know. I reckon I, I reckon I probably cut that <laughs> 10 days ago. But that doesn't happen in a pub. You know, you've got a day dot on it. You stick the day dot on it and you throw it away. I mean, obviously, everybody knows that there might be a pub out there here and there where somebody re day dots something. But generally, I'd say 99.9% of the time, you have got managers, kitchen managers, kitchen staff, kitchen team leaders, that they know that they will lose their job if they re day dot it. Yeah. And that is only worth that meal or, you know, that, that piece of that ingredient that they are that, that that it's out of date doesn't cost loads of money yeah. but it could cost them loads of money yeah. so you know the the reward is not worth the risk so they just throw it away yeah and that, and that's it and i think you know when you're working even when we worked for weatherspoons i mean their stock controls are second to none yeah. and they they always want you to get you know greens on stock <laughs> um but you can still achieve a green with throwing things away as long as you record where it's gone I threw it away because it was out of date. Okay, you're not going to get told off. No, no one's going to tell you off ever in any any pub, any pub group, anything that I've ever worked for. You're never going to get told off for throwing something away that is out of date. No. Never. Anywhere. Yeah. No, nowhere's going. So, to. for me, the practices that pubs have always had in place, what the hospitality has to do is it has to change all of the time, constantly. There is always a new rule. There is always a new law. There is always something new that comes out and in, that affects hospitality. And hospitality go, all right, no problem. We'll take it in a stride. We don't moan. We don't fuss. We don't kick our feet. We don't, you know, get PC and whingy. We just go, yeah. all right, sound. Got to do that then. No crack problem. On, yeah. yeah, we'll crack on. We'll get it done. So with this, this is no different. With the COVID, it is no different. Put some hand sanitizer stations out. Make sure your team are going and, you know, sanitizing and disinfecting touch points, um, you know, toilet doors, taps in toilets, yeah. you know, and as well as tables, chairs, normal doors, whatever. Make sure people are staying away from each other. Make sure you're telling the rules to people as they're coming in. Yeah. You can't get up and walk around. If you do, you've got to put your mask on. Yeah. But please just only walk to the toilet and back. Like. Yeah can't just be walking up to other tables where you don't know and if you do <laughs> then we'll ask you to leave yeah, and that's course, it yeah. and i think all of this happens they are without a shadow of a doubt the, the, in my opinion the safest place to go safer than my own home i agree 
I agree. And, and yet nobody's coming and visiting because everyone's scared. And the reason why everyone's scared is because whoever's controlling the media is controlling the fear. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and it's a massive shame. Like, it's heartbreaking walking up through the city centre and just seeing everybody empty. Like, and it's everybody. heartbreaking seeing seeing places closed down, as you said, blooming King's Heath. You know, it's a, it's a massive shame. Like, yeah. unbelievably. And uh, there are loads of places that are going to follow. Loads and loads of places. And it would not surprise me if some of the big boys start following as well. I mean... You know, we're, as, as a company, I don't know how safe we are. As a general manager, I mean, you know, I'm one of 2,000 general managers in this company, yeah. so they're not going to disclose that information with me, but no. who knows? Who knows how safe it is? I can tell you something. It's not, it's not taking the money that it wants to be taking. And if it's, not, if it's not taking the money that it wants to be taking, and if it's making staff redundant, then it's, you know, we're on a, we're on a downward spiral, unfortunately. Go to the city centre. Yeah. Visit pubs. Come to the city. Well, um, unless we're in a four-week lockdown. Yeah, unless that <laughs> happens. Yeah, but yeah, you know, people do need to... Yeah. I mean, yeah, go to your local places. Go to, you know, King's Heath, Harborn, yeah. Solihull, wh- whatever it is. But bloody hell, man. Come and visit us in the city centre and just Basically, make a booking. Yeah. Yeah. Make a booking. It's that simple. Make a booking and honour it. You know. Yeah, that's the important thing. That's the important And if you thing. can't... Just phone. Just phone and cancel. <laughs> or text or no one, email. No right? one. No one is gonna. I, I don't know. I don't know why people are scared of cancelling bookings. It drives like, me insane. Oh, it's insane. Like, what do you think people are gonna do? Shove their hand down the throat and grab <laughs> down the phone and grab it around the throat. This is, there's no way. No one's gonna shout at you for not being able to make your booking. Instead, what they'll do is they'll go, "Thank you. You've given me the opportunity today to get somebody to fill that table." Yeah. yeah. And it, it and it, it, it's that simple. We, you know, we we've had it. I think. We're all right now. What we do is on Saturdays, we ask for a deposit for bookings. It's only a fiver ahead. I think you have to. Yeah, I think, I think everyone should do that. Yeah. And, and, and they get their money back straight away as soon as they come in. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, their, their first round of drinks that they pay for, the money will be taken off that first round of drinks. Yeah, that's the way so, to do it. I yeah, it's, it's, it's simple. People do it authenticating the card. Um, we, unfortunately, for this company that we work for, we can't do that because obviously it's open to people stealing. So, <laughs> so we have to take the deposit, but then, yeah, we give the money back, and and that's the easiest way. And we still have loads and loads of bookings, but we only have bookings now on a Saturday. Like it's insane. Yeah. The rest of the week, you come into Birmingham City Centre on a Monday, man. I've been, I've been in the city centre. Oh so we have a job well, for like Broad Street. So. You're you're one of about six people that come into Birmingham City Centre on a Monday. Then yeah, it is, mental. it is a ghost town. It is an absolute ghost town, and that's it. I know that people are just looking after their own health, and that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. That is absolutely fine. Um, but bloody hell, someone needs to do something to I get think people it's a little out. Bit that. I think a li- little bit scared, and then a, a little bit like maybe forgetting the city centre as well, because you're yeah. not working in the city centre. You think, oh, I've got no reason to go in there. Maybe. Yeah, that's it. I, I think, think they do need this more than ever. I mean, Juju's put up a photo last Friday night, yeah, I think it so was, and it was like... Yeah, empty. No one in there. Man. I know, that's it. But like, that's just... They've, they're the only ones that put the photo off, but I'm sure it was the same in loads of places yeah, across yeah. the city. That's it, and I do. You know, I, I feel I feel really sorry for independents at the moment. I think you know they've they've put their heart and soul and money into their job, but you know me, and although I don't work for an independent, although I work for a corporation, I still put my heart and soul, blood, sweat, and tears oh, in, in into this and into running this and uh, and and making sure it's right, mm-hmm. and. Even, you know, I know, although I might not lose my business, I could still lose my job. I could still be made redundant. If we're not making any money and this pub has to be closed, then what the hell do they need a general manager for? Yeah. They don't. And, and, and that's the same with my team. And though we've already made redundancies, you know, who knows where that's going to stop? You know, it's, it's coming up to January soon. And notoriously, January is the yeah. quietest, you know. No, and it, it, In the industry, no one looks forward to January. No one looks forward to January. And I think if this is still like this now in January, then yeah, it's going to be exposed so much that so many places are just going to close. And the thing is, then what will happen is you'll get people that will come out, let's say next year, you know, for the first time in 18 months, they've gone out yeah, and then they're going and then they'll be putting on their social media, fucking hell, man, I can't believe this place is closed down. I can't believe this place is closed down. Where have all these places gone? Well, they've gone because you didn't come out. You didn't support them when they needed you, yeah. and, and and that's it. I think 
you know everybody needs help at the moment mm. and uh, we're just not getting it yeah it's heartbreaking i mean it's, i don't know what to say like it, talking to everyone in the industry it's i just feel for you all uh, yeah I really do it's an absolute killer I don't really want to finish the podcast <laughs> on that. <laughs> on that, lo- on that low. <laughs> uh, I just thought maybe, where do you like eating in Birmingham? Where do I like eating in Birmingham? Yeah, or drinking or Mate, look, at, do you like look at the size of me. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> like, we went Pineapple Club. <laughs> I like eating in a Pineapple Club was brilliant, wasn't it? Yeah, that Absolutely was brilliant. <coughs> I think personally, I, I, I love a cocktail. Like I'm yeah. getting to that age of my life where obviously I like an ale, but I love a cocktail. <laughs> um, so I like... I like the Victoria. The Victoria is nice because it's close to here, yeah. um, and and that, yeah, that's one of them. It's easy to get to. <laughs> <laughs> it's a flat street. The, <laughs> There's no steps. The least amount of time it takes me to get to a pub, <laughs> the best. <laughs> um, my 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 favourite two cocktail bars in Birmingham uh, is Forty St Pauls, without a shadow of a doubt. What a venue, man. What an absolute pleasure it is to go in there. I'm glad it's just reopened. Uh, I've not had a chance to go back in there at the moment, obviously. It's only reopened, what, uh, two weeks ago? Yeah, he was fairly cautious. Yeah, he was very cautious and, and fair play. It is tiny, isn't it, in there? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, But, yeah, I love, I love going there. Um, uh, and I also um, love the Edgebaston Hotel. Mm. That's a great place for a, for a drink as well. Eating-wise, well, as, as you'll agree, my... Best meal that I've ever eaten in my entire life is when I went to Ophim for my 40th yeah, birthday. Yeah, oh my god, <laughs> how good is Actar, man? It's just ridiculous. So it's special, like it's unlike any other tasting menu I've had. No, oh, I just I dream about it every night. <laughs> <laughs> and you were right, even though you're uh, even though you're Irish and you were bound to choose the the potato dish, uh, the, my favourite dish of the, the whole the whole evening was uh, was the potato one. I was chatting to someone who went there yesterday or the day before, and they said as well the potato dish really? was the best. Really, it was just. Yeah. Fucking hell, man! The layers to that was just incredible, absolutely unbelievable. So yeah, I, um, I've got a really good curry house that's near me called Vape Haven, and they do these table-sized doses. That looks wicked, that though. You keep putting their <laughs> stories up. I'm just like, wow, what is Mate, that? Honestly, it is just <laughs> unreal. There, that's a little tiny um, independent place in Harborn, um, and it is tiny. And it, again, they're struggling like everybody else. Yeah. Um, we went in there on. Um, last Saturday, um, took my, my daughter. Um, she loves it, absolutely loves it there. We were one of th- one of three tables in there. They only had um, eight tables in there um, that they could seat people, but there was only three tables, and we were in there at what eight o'clock on a Saturday night. You know, it, that, that places like that should be busy. A year ago, you wouldn't have got in there. Probably wouldn't have got you in there. Have to book. Wouldn't have got, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. And uh, you know, so you got to got to do your things for that. But I think me personally, as you know, I like. I like drinking, mate. <laughs> I don't care where I'm going. You like your coffee? My favourite. 200 degrees. Yeah, 200 degrees coffee is, oh my God. Yeah, I they, like 200 degrees. They are, they it are brilliant. It wasn't open this morning. Oh, was it not? Well, I'll tell you what, I like a Pret. Yeah, Pret's all right. Pret's my favourite of the Chinese corner. Uh, Starbucks is the worst, isn't it? I hate Starbucks. Yeah, I hate it, I mate. Thought you, I thought you were going to say you like no, it. No, I, I hate that. it. It's just <laughs> like burnt coffee. It's yeah, horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. Costas is better than Starbucks, but Costas isn't great. Yeah, Costas isn't great. I like Pret. I tell you what, if you're in a rush and you and you want to go for a drive through McDonald's, ain't bad for coffee. Well, I don't drive, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a bit strange. Get, <laughs> ask, asking, the, asking the bus driver. <laughs> yeah, mate, turn right, yeah. Um, McDonald's ain't bad, but yeah, 200 degrees. I was hoping it was going to be open this morning. Yeah. And I didn't realise they've got one round the corner here now. Yeah, yeah, I just around the that. corner, yeah. That's where I go. Uh, yeah, <laughs> mate, you know, just go to this one, have a Spanish latte, you know, change your mind. Um, but yeah, my favourite my favorite two pubs in Birmingham then, I'd say, are the old Joint Stock and the old Contemptibles. I mean, obviously, I've got a massive affiliation with the old Contemptibles, mm-hmm. but the service in there, the ales that they have on, uh, the standards that they keep is the just... Building? Mate, the oh, building's wicked. Fucking delicious. And the old joint stock. The old joint stock. When you walk in, that, that's the kind of place when people when, when people from Burton, you know, when my friends yeah. come across, when people come out, over from out of town, I will always tell them to go in there. That building is just fantastic. It's stunning. Like. Yeah. And you used to go in there on a Friday or something and it was busy. Like, yeah. It was a real buzz because the bar was in the middle. 
Yeah, just yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Places that I won't go though is Weatherspoons. I won't, <laughs> I won't go there. Just we have no love for Weatherspoons. Not anymore. No. It's a, it's a the pos- this is the positive podcast yeah. about food and drink until it comes to Weatherspoons, and then we just slug it. Off. Slug it off. It's, <laughs> they're fucking awful, aren't they? They are. I think it's because we've seen it from the inside. Yeah. And I mean, there's nothing bad. Like, there's no bad practices or standards I'll tell you what, the it's standards, one of the highest. oh my god <laughs> I'd, I'd say the standards are the cleanest they are the cleanest pubs you could ever wish to go to yeah. like, without a shadow of a doubt like i've i've never seen standards like it in like all a, of the in audits. the kitchen you have to do deep clean clean in the morning when you came in and, and then, then at night, night as well. yeah yeah <laughs> it was insane isn't it why am i cleaning this in the morning when they've done it last night, last night. It, it was insane the glass wash machines for me like working in pubs all my life Glass wash machines, you, you you deep clean them twice a week. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, weather spoons, you deep clean that every single night. Like, take it apart. The ice machine, take that apart twice, three times a week. And and, and I'm like, you, you're cleaning it, but it's clean. But that's what that's how you keep on top of it. It's easy to clean something that's already clean. I think they're just soulless. Yeah, that, that's the problem with weather spoons. By a massive there is, gammon. Yeah, he's a prick, isn't <laughs> he? Might edit that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he, they, they are soulless. I mean, they're, they're no music thing and they're no atmosphere. And yeah, it's just they're boring, aren't they? Yeah. They're really, really boring. Anyway, mate, on that note, thank I you. Took up a lot of your time and I really appreciate you doing this. I was a bit worried because you know, sometimes I think I've heard people who say when they get their mate on the podcast, yeah. it doesn't really work, but I feel like this has done good. Well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping so. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thank yeah, you very much for, for asking me to come along. Yeah, well, you yeah. know. You know Carly, yeah, you I've met him. I've met him, but I haven't seen him in years, though. Yeah. Oh, apart from obviously on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and stuff. I'd, I'd say that you know I'm probably Breaking Bread's number one fan. I could do with a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we should get some t-shirts made or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I love pre- the number one. I appreciate it, man, and I appreciate all your support, letting us record it back us a few times. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Really appreciate it. Cheers, Anything man. you need, no worries. Hey everyone, massive thank you for listening. We absolutely love making these episodes and bringing you the story of some of the best people in the food industry in Birmingham. As we said before, we love Birmingham and its food scene and we think it's truly special. So if you agree, do us one big favour. All you have to do is rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps promote the podcast and gets us listened to by more people and gets more people to listen to how great Birmingham is and we would really appreciate if you could do that for us until next time thanks again for listening